both the blessing and the curse of talking about um, a, a good topic of conversation for everyone, and that is water. Is it going to rain? Do we have enough moisture in the soil? Um, so let's just get started. Can anybody tell me what this figure is meant to illustrate? A water cycle or the hydrologic cycle. And whether you remember it or not, most of you were probably first exposed to this concept at some point in general science in elementary school. Um, I think my son first came home from school in second grade talking about evaporation. He might have learned it in first grade too, but somehow none of the papers came home from school that year. Um, so we know that we can pick up at any point in this cycle and we can follow the path of water through the natural system. So we might start with water in the atmosphere forming precipitation that's going to fall to the land surface. And then at the land surface, that's going to be partitioned. And some of that might um, run off as overland flow. Some of it's going to infiltrate into the soil where it becomes part of our soil moisture storage. It might recharge groundwater. And all of that collectively might um, work its way horizontally into the streams and lakes and rivers. And then the, by far the largest portion is actually going to go back into the atmosphere as evapotranspiration. So we've learned about this a lot over time, but what's embedded in the concept of the water cycle is that that water in the natural earth system is not created or destroyed. And so for all practical purposes, it might change forms um, between liquid, vapor, solid, but we're not losing water. And what that means is that we could take a block of the natural system, impose a, a control volume around it, and the water that's coming into that minus what's going out of it is going to have to equal the change in the storage of water inside that box. And depending on your area of interest in the question that you're asking, that box might be different in size. We might look at the entire globe, in which case the fluxes in and out are, are really pretty negligible. Um, but we might look at global land surfaces or a watershed or an individual field, which is often what we're doing as part of this project. So to explain that concept, we can start with something that's a very basic control volume, your bathtub. So we have a volume that's defined by the edge of the bathtub. You might imagine a, a virtual surface blocking off the top of the tub. And then I'm going to have some fluxes in and out of this tub. So I turn on the spigot and I have an inflow into my control volume of five gallons per minute. Well, I was a little distracted last night when I was running the bath for the kids and I forgot to close the drain. So maybe I have an outflow at the same time on the order of two gallons per minute. And so um, am I getting any change in storage? Am I getting water in my bathtub? Well, my inflow is greater than my outflow. And so after one minute, how much water do I have left in my tub? Thank you, three gallons. So if we think in terms of a mass of water instead of a volume, just multiply by the density, you can see why we talk about this as a water balance, right? The, after 10 minutes of filling my tub, if I still haven't noticed that my drain is open, the 30 gallons of water in my tub has to be the same mass as all of the water that came into the tub minus the water that went out through the drain. And so that's the concept of the water balance. We're balancing mass. Many of you will have recognized that what I'm describing is a really simplified statement of the conservation of mass. Since water in the natural cycle is not being created or destroyed, if we take any fundamental volume, what's coming into an area minus what goes out has to be balanced by the change in mass inside that volume. And so DSDT would be my change in storage, and then I and O are my inflows and outflows. Now in the natural system, the water balance becomes a little bit more complex than just looking at a bathtub, but the concept is exactly the same. And so we're gonna start doing, to create a water balance or to do a water balance calculation. The first step is going to be to define the control volume. Now as a hydrologist, my first choice would be a watershed, not because there's anything magical about the size of a watershed. You can have a very small watershed or a very large watershed, but because it is defined by topography, um, so that I don't have to worry about inflows coming sort of over the land surface and jumping into my watershed. It simplifies my water balance. Also, because my water is going to flow to a common outlet point where my queue is at the bottom of the watershed, it means 
I really only need to measure my water right there if I really just want to know what's leaving my volume. I don't have to try to measure all of the runoff on the land surface or all of the water traveling um, through the subsurface. Okay, so first um, point is going to be to choose your control volume. And then you need to start to list your inflow and outflow terms. And so we're going to go through some of the primary ones and talk about how we can measure them and how well do we know them um, in the natural system. So certainly, usually, um, in most control volumes, our biggest inflow is going to be precipitation, what's coming down from the sky. Um, and in this case, nationally, even globally, we do have a well-established measurement network. Fairly high spatial density, although often not as much as we would like, and fairly low tech. Um, you know, for most places, the precipitation of record is with, from our cooperative observer stations. You have essentially an eight-inch bucket that's sitting outside, and once a day, some poor soul has to come out and empty the bucket and measure how much water is in it. Um, so there are problems with the system. Of course, precipitation is high, has high spatial variability, especially when we have our convective thunderstorms in the summer. Um, and there are, are a lot of catch errors, especially in areas where we have high winds or a lot of snow precipitation, so that in general our reported precipitation is an underestimate of the actual amount of precipitation that reaches the land surface. All right, so I'm not going to the second largest term in the water balance, but the second most easily and readily measured, and that would be stream flow. When we are in a system where we have a watershed and we can measure our water balance in one central location, um, in the U.S., the United States Geological Survey does most of our monitoring of stream flow. Um, local and state agencies might also establish stream gauges, so all of those dots on the map are USGS real-time stations where you can actually go online and get um, stream flow data from an hour ago, and then there are more stations that are not real-time. And then what I'm showing in the lower figures are, in some smaller watersheds, your experiment station, you might not have a USGS station. And so often, we're also going out to establish our own stream monitoring site, where what we're using is the little coiled sensor, maybe a pressure transducer to continuously measure the height of the water in the river over time. And then we're using periodic measurements of the velocity, which is what the two young ladies in the stream are doing. Um, in most situations, unless you're dealing with an extremely small stream or drainage pipe, we're not continuously measuring velocity. We're measuring the height of the water and then generating a relationship between the height and the velocity. Okay, and then um, the third big one, the, by far the largest outflow term in the land surface water balance would be evaporation and transpiration, or lumped together evapotranspiration. Um, so global average, this would be two-thirds of incoming precipitation leaves again as evapotranspiration. Um, so really big component, but we don't have that good of a measurement network. Um, historically, we would use an evaporation pan to, to measure potential evaporation. Gives us a good index of weather conditions, how much water could go into the atmosphere, but it's not telling us if there was actually water available in that system to evaporate. And so it's going to be a much higher number than actual evapotranspiration in a lot of environments. The schematic on the bottom is showing a lysimeter, something like we have at our Kashokton sites, um, where you can have for a carefully constructed, isolated sort of mini watershed, you're essentially backing out actual evapotranspiration using a water balance for that isolated piece of land. Um, so that can give us a very reliable, long-term, continuous measurement of ET, requires a lot of infrastructure, so we generally don't have very many of them. So we don't have very good spatial representation. Um, and then in the upper left, my final thing is showing sort of state-of-the-art in terms of um, micrometeorological measurement if we have an eddy covariance or eddy correlation system which is essentially sampling water vapor flux directly. So you're getting an actual measurement of vapor flux away from the land surface. So you can have a very high temporal resolution measurement of actual evapotranspiration, but they're very expensive and they're very sensitive. So once again, we don't have very long time coverage or very extensive spatial coverage in terms of that sort of ET measurement. Okay, so taking a break here, since I've covered my big three water balance components, um, 
if we're looking, if we're asking questions about long-term what's going on in an area, if we have continuous measurements for a long time, um, often these three can get us um, answer a lot of questions. And so I'm giving an example here for if we wanted to do a water balance for all of the land surface of the globe. And I'm saying long term because my goal here is to minimize the change in storage terms. Remember my water balance, a change in storage of all the water in your control volume has to be balanced by what's coming in and what's going out. If I take a long enough time period, my change in storage is going to be really small compared to all of the fluxes in and out. And so that's why I can do something like the land surface on average receives 31 inches of precipitation a year and 19 inches of that goes back to the atmosphere as evapotranspiration and that has to be balanced by all of the rivers in the world that enter into the ocean that results in approximately 12 inches per year of runoff and so that the 31 is going to equal that 19 plus 12. We can use that same concept for our field sites in this case so my my simplified short-term water balance or long-term water balance that ET is balanced by precipitation minus stream flow and so I can use that by finding um, a local watershed to each of our field sites to find that our, my estimate of the lowest long-term average ET from our field sites is actually at the Kellogg station in southern Michigan, 524 millimeters. And our largest, see if my animations are working, is actually at our CPAC site in southern Indiana, um, 744 millimeters per year. And CPAC happens to be the site that also has the recorded highest precipitation per year, so it makes sense that it has the highest ET. Kellogg does not have the lowest um, precipitation per year. There we're dealing with more of an energy limited environment where the ET is lower because of the influence of snow and ice and cold temperatures in their hydrologic cycle. And then you can see um, the numbers to the rest of the map showing that generally we have more um, annual ET in the south and east of our domain and then it's decreasing as we go north and west. Okay, so I haven't seen a flag yet, so I'll keep going. Um, when we want to look smaller in scale or at shorter time intervals, because we don't have lots and lots of years of data um, for our existing field sites, we often need to bring in other components of the water balance to look at the field scale. And there's my flag. Um, so for example, we might be concerned with water flowing over the surface. Um, a lot of our sites have artificial subsurface drainage, so we might need to look at drain flow um, or other subsurface losses um, that, w that are not going to be captured by a stream gauging site, so we need to capture them in some other way. Um, and then our storage terms also might become much more important when we're looking at seasonal changes or wet dry cycles or precipitation patterns. And so some of the, the three dominant storage terms that might be important on that left hand side of our equation, looking at change in snow so storage, which many of us neglect because we're concerned with the growing season, but I would argue if we really want to know what's going on with climate change and how our spring conditions are being set up to be different, we can't ignore what's going on over the winter as well. Depression storage on the surface and soil moisture storage. Um, so this is showing one example of what some of those terms might look like for our DPAC site in Indiana um, with precipitation on the top, the change in storage over east hour um, in the middle, and then our drain flow on the bottom. And I'll just take one second to show the difference between the drain flow lines. One of these is for a managed field. Um, the green line is drain flow for a managed field. Um, so using drainage water management, it has drain flow restricted. So you can see during this precipitation event, it had a larger temporary increase in soil moisture storage, um, and the drain flow didn't increase until a few days later. Um, whereas in the unmanaged field, the, the red line with the three pulses going up and down, um, where you had drain flow responding immediately to the precipitation pulses, and that role, that change in soil moisture storage is less important in that system. Okay. So my final slide, I don't have a summary. All I wanted to point out was that last point that um, over long-term time scales, periods that aren't undergoing a lot of change, that often we're trying to simplify our water balance to neglect those storage terms. But when we're going to shorter time scales 
or periods of change, even like global climate change, where the whole system is under change, we can't neglect those storage terms in the, in the water balance. And then my, my final thought is we've learned that the it, water travels in a cycle, and so we know that despite current conditions, it will rain again. <laughs>